Whiskey is defined as a spirit made from malted grain, but we know it's so much more than that. Whiskey is passion. It's our history and it's our community. Join us as we explore what it means to be a part of the whiskey culture. Moonrise Distillery lies deep in the hills of Clayton, Georgia. It's a great place with an awesome lineup of spirits headed up by Doug, a man who takes his passion for the art of distillation rather seriously. This is a distillery that fuses art and science to create something truly exceptional. I'm Greg Sinodinos, your host. Join us down here at the Rick House as we find out what makes Moonrise Distillery so unique. Hello everyone, we're here at Moonrise Distillery in Clayton, Georgia. We're here with Doug, the owner. Doug, thank you for having us, we That's appreciate it. That's my pleasure, it. glad to have you here. So you all really take a lot of pride in whiskey and uh, we were talking to you a little bit before we started filming and there is just, uh, just a ton of information. You are a wellspring of knowledge, but not just knowledge, but pride in your craft and pride in the science and the art of distillation. You take it very, very seriously. I mean, more so than than many of the distillers that we've met. Um, why don't you talk just a little bit about Moonrise and why you're so passionate about it? Yeah, well, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. It's it's not just that we're passionate about Moonrise. We're we're very passionate about the tradecraft, right? The nice thing about doing this is every day you teach, you have people that come into your distillery. They're passionate about it and you get to share that passion back with them. How many jobs do you have in the country, in the world, where you get people that are actually interested in something that you like to do, right? So we get to share the intimacy of something that's an American tradition, right? That has been performed by so many people, you know, over such a long period of time. And it's just a, uh, an indigenous part of America, right? So that's what it is. So I, I think when you become a distiller, you realize that you're part of something much bigger than yourself and you almost don't want to let it down right so you know every day i teach every day i learn and the other thing is it's a it's a cooperative industry it's not a competitive industry right so the old adage a rising tide floats all boats mm -hmm. isn't crap it's actually true right and there's so many people in this industry that think the same way right so we don't just want to see ourselves do well we want to see all of our brothers and sisters out there do well also. So, um, you know, you know that if you turn out a mediocre product, that doesn't just reflect poorly on you, that reflects poorly on your industry. It also reflects poorly on those that came before you that shared. All right, the nice thing about this is you can't go to uh, Bill and Ted's Technical Institute and <laughs> learn how to do this, right? So, you know, the, the reason distillers that have been around for a while will share and train and apprentice new people into the industry is because people did that for us, right? So, you know, we want to really take the quality. You know, when I think of a craft spirit, I think of something that's always made by hand Right, it is made with the best ingredients. In our case, we're fortunate up here, we have tremendous access to local ingredients uh, and the best trade craft, right? So at the end of the day, you know, at Moonrise, what we feel is we wanna use the best ingredients. We wanna use the best trade craft without compromise and treat everyone like family, right? So, and now over the years we've been open, you know, we're now seeing going from 30 people a month to 8,000 people a month. And uh, so we're just so grateful for the extended family that we've been able to, to do here. So, you know, part of that is the product set. You know, we've got over 20 products now, you know, 10 top shelf spirits, and then we've got 10 ready to drink craft cocktails, you know, and people, the quality speaks, the trade craft speaks, right, to the people. Yeah. So no sugar, no high fructose corn syrup, no monosodium glutamate, no sorbates for shelf life. But that's the thing. So, you know, we want people to have those products, that experience they want to be a part of, and that backstory that they can connect with. Mm -hmm. And you look at the history of, you know, spirits in the United States, and they were families, right? You start with those 2,000 families that came over from Europe through the Port of Delaware. Where'd they go? They went to the wild, wild west, which at the time was Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Right. So there's a long family history. We're a family operation, and we want everybody here to feel like family. 
Awesome. Well, let's check it out. After learning a bit about the distillery, we headed back to see where the spirits are aged. Doug gets seriously technical about his aging process and how the wood interacts with the whiskey. He's dedicated a significant amount of time and effort to make sure that his spirits are aging effectively. That's something that we can appreciate as well. And it truly shows his love and passion for these spirits in the science and art behind aging them. So Doug, everything from the grains that you use to your understanding of, of the molecular science behind the aging process and, and fermentation and everything, I mean, it's, it's unparalleled. Um, but one of the things that you were talking about specifically that we want to hone in here is, is aging and how that works. And um, there's a lot that people talk about when it comes to barrel aging. A lot of people talk about temperature. A lot of people talk mm -hmm. about seasons and how humid the environment is. But uh, a lot of people, they don't talk about the actual filtration of the whiskey through the, through the wood, how sure. that works. And then you were telling us a bit about the pressure systems inside the barrels actually being integral to the aging process mm -hmm. itself. Yep. Could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually look at this overall process. You know, it's almost like constructing a sentence, right? So we talked earlier about the source of the sugar. Why do we use the grains that we do? Very, very simply, we'll talk more about it in detail later, but the, the grains give us sugar and they give us nutrients, right? Not just sugar. Everybody out there that, that loves a whiskey knows that when yeast eats sugar, it creates alcohol. Yep. What you don't realize is when yeast eats nutrients from each of the individual types of grains, it creates the foundation for another layer of complex flavor, right? So we're gonna do that in the mashing process. We're gonna create a buffet line for the yeast, right? And over a five to seven day period, that yeast is gonna create everything, right? So it's gonna create our alcohol, it's gonna create the foundation for our flavors. Now, the problem is it's also gonna create not just one alcohol, but a whole bunch of alcohols. So the other thing that people don't realize is yeast eating alcohol, eating sugar creates alcohol, but alcohol kills yeast. So you can only get that alcohol up to a certain point, right, in your fermentation process, Got it. right? Here it's 14%. So we have to distill twice. First time we're gonna distill is so we can get the alcohol by volume up. Right, so the only place that makes alcohol in a distillery we know is a fermenter. So once we're done with fermentation, we can't increase ABV, alcohol by volume, by increasing alcohol. We have to lower the volume. And we take advantage of the fact that every alcohol boils at a unique point right, and long before water. So we can go into the stripping still or the beer still and we can take advantage of those boiling points to leave all the water, ideally, in the kettle and put all of the alcohol coming off of the parrot on the other side. So the goal of the first distillation, pretty simple, get the ABV up, right? The second distillation, goal of that, very simple, harvest only the alcohols that you want. Out of those 206, how many do you wanna keep? Now, the output of that, in my opinion, is 30% of the equation, right? So we've created the foundation to our bourbon, to the flavor profiles we want. We created a highly engineered catalyst that's also a solvent, which is going to come into play with the char, uh, but it's still only 30% of the equation. Yeah. These barrels and aging and blending, again, in my opinion, is 70% of the equation. There's a lot of folks out there that can distill, but blending, maybe not their strong point, right? So if you and I both had access to everything identical in our still house, and we did everything exactly the same, but we came over here and we would blend two completely different bourbon whiskeys, right? Yeah. So, and that's what's unique and that's a good thing, right? So what we've got to think about is there's two reasons we use char in a barrel, right? The first is we all know that whiskey comes off clear, right? So distillation is separation, right? So in stage two distilling, we're actually separating impurities, right? Mm -hmm. Now impurities are like bacteria, they're not all bad. So what are some good impurities? Color, flavor, aroma. So the higher the proof, the more you separate out color, flavor, and aroma, which is why vodka is gonna be distilled at or above 95% alcohol. 
right? So it's somewhat, we like to call it a neutral spirit, even though that's a little misleading. Where we know our bourbon whiskey to be bourbon can come off higher than 80%, 160 proof. If we went any higher, we would lose all those foundation flavor compounds that we built in fermentation. Would be kind of silly to do, right? right? So if you and I came in here with vodka and we put it into this same barrel and we let it sit for four years, what would we get? Brown colored vodka, <laughs> right? Because we have, we don't have those foundations of flavor compounds that we need to combine with what's here. So in my view, you need a highly engineered catalyst that's also a solvent, but you also need a barrel that's been designed to match that, right? Otherwise, they're not going to melt. You're not going to get a bad bourbon, but it's going to be kind of meh, right? So what we have is typically a master distiller is going to have a barrel protocol. And that barrel protocol will instruct the cooperage on exactly how you want that barrel to be prepped, designed, right, uh, treated. So for example, everyone knows you've got to use brand new American white oak that's charred. Okay, that's great. Where's the wood come from? How long is it open air aged, right? Um, is it toasted before it's charred? All of those kinds of things, right? So I've got a fairly elaborate barrel protocol, right? We work with one cooperage. So I can't go on Amazon once a month and go, hey, who's got the cheapest barrels, right? <laughs> so that barrel again is, plus the blending that comes out of it is 70% of that equation. So it's very, very important. So simply put, the two things we look to for the char, one obviously is color, right? You've heard me say the white whiskey is a highly engineered catalyst and solvent, mm -hmm. right? So when we look at that brand new, I use a number three char, which just simply means they toast, they char it until it's three millimeters thick, right? Very scientific. <laughs> so this is a one year old barrel stave in front of us, right? So the, if we looked at that brand new out of the shrink wrap, that three milliliter, millimeters would look like the tire tread pattern on the BFG tires on my Jeep. Got it. In just one year, that solvent has eaten those tire treads away. And that particulate matter goes into suspension and becomes the color that we know and love in our bourbon. Now, the second thing is we know bourbon has to be majority corn. So, but the last thing that we want in a good bourbon <laughs> is a corn smell or corn aroma. So if you look at this under a microscope, you'll find honeycombs and those honeycombs actually over time absorb that corn taste and smell, right? So when I evaluate a barrel somewhere between year four and year seven, first thing I'm testing for is any residual corn smell or flavor, right? So if I detect any, that barrel goes to the back of the barrel house. I say, you think about what you did, young man. I'll see you next <laughs> year, right? And we repeat that process. So that's really what the char is for. Now, inside that inch and an eighth stave are sugars, lipids, fatty acids, and the flavor compounds that are gonna unite with what we created in fermentation and create that expansive flavor profile. There's over 4,000 possible permutations of how that highly engineered catalyst and all the yummy stuff from the barrel are gonna combine. So every barrel is going to be different, right? So in the still house, the master distiller is in charge. In the barrel house, God's in charge. Our job is to figure out out of every unique barrel, what did we get, yeah. right? And so you have to have kind of a unique rating scheme because it's not just about time, right? So I blend by taste, not by time. You know, I have seven year barrels that are not as good as a four or five year barrel. I age in a 30 gallon barrel. I take advantage of the higher contact ratio, liquid to contact ratio that we get from a 30 gallon barrel. So in a seven year age, I can get a lot of the characteristics that a 10 to 14 year barrel would do, or bourbon would get in a 53 gallon barrel. Plus I'm getting old and I'm tired of lifting 53 gallon barrels around. <laughs> so, but that's an important thing. If you went any smaller, some people try to go smaller, but if you do, now you end up with a race condition. Right now, the characteristics of this char overpower and outrace the extraction of all the yummy flavor stuff, right? So. What I care about in a bourbon is when I put a bourbon in my mouth, I want it to feel viscous, right? Yeah. I want it to feel thicker than water, right? Uh, one, it's just a comforting, substantial feel. It's like chicken soup, right? Yep. So the second thing is it coats your mouth, right? So once you finally do swallow that, it's gonna linger for a long time. So I don't care as much about color, right? Because a lot of folks are spoofing that color anyway, right? 
Uh, so what I do care about, we do get a deep rich color anyway, which is nice. But what I care about is that viscosity. I care about that linger, right? And to me, the aroma is huge, right? Yeah. So your nose tells your brain what your mouth is gonna taste, right? So if you start out with that beautiful aroma, then you're, you've got that flavor train on the right track, right, for a customer. So it's gonna take you know, somewhere between year four and year seven in our shop uh, for all those characteristics to really develop. Uh, we don't go any higher than seven. Uh, you know, at that point, we feel like with our barrel stays, we have extracted everything that we're gonna get from the barrel. You know, mm -hmm. at that point, it's neutral. And then we get to share them with our brewery friends, our wineries, our meateries, our cideries, and so they end up buying them. But you can literally track, based on this sugar line, you can track the penetration. Right, so we see in year one, we see our spirit go halfway into the barrel based on pressure, right? And you hinted at that earlier. I think pressure is much more important than temperature, right? So at the end of the day, I need to expand a molecule and in a confined space like a barrel, it's gonna build up pressure in the summer and that's what's gonna drive this in. In the winter when it gets cold, the reverse happens. They condense, at that point it draws a vacuum and now you're gonna draw some of that nice stuff out there. Well, once you lather, rinse, and repeat that a number of times, you get to the point where you've exhausted all of the elementals that are in that barrel. And for us, that's somewhere between year four and year seven. Now that we've seen how it's aged, it's time to turn back the clock and see how the spirits are made at the beginning of the process. As with everything else, Moonrise takes a very technical approach to their distillation. Everything is done by hand, allowing them to pick the best grains, temperatures, and processes to make a consistently delicious spirit. Let's take a look and find out more. All right, so this is where it all happens. This is where this whole process starts. So what we've got to do here, we make a four grain whiskey. So both our bourbon and our rye are both four grains. So first thing we do is start out with our corn, We've got to break down that complex carbohydrate down into our sugars and our nutrients. So it all starts in these mash ton cookers. Everything here, yeah, this is the crew that does it. So our assistant head distiller, CJ Nasser, um, Sam Thompson is the director that keeps all of this running for us. But as a small operation, we all pretty much got to do everything when we need to. So uh, I like to look at it this way. This is my number one for making product. This is my number one for making sure that the mousetrap that we've got to use to make the product is always working and running. So this process is really interesting. When the old timers used to do this, the only time they knew that their mash was ready is when they stuck their finger in it and it tasted sweet, right? So Sam's gonna show you what the mash looks like in the beginning. We're at the corn stage now, we're up at 190 degrees. So. Basically, I say that looks like a 300 gallon bowl of creamy white grits and it tastes like brown sugar once we get done. That's gonna be the buffet line that we're going to feed uh, to the yeast over a seven day process. The next thing that CJ is going to do is add in the additional grains. So corn is first, it's the toughest to break down. At that point, we're going to do our malteds, right? So you'll have your barley, you'll have your wheat, you'll have your rye. And at the end of that process, I guess that typically, what, six to eight hours? About that. So at the end of that process, we're gonna pump this out using this big old pump right here. And it's going to be put into these big fermenters. So at that point, for the first three to four hours, as CJ adds the yeast in here, that yeast is gonna go in in a one gallon that's going to have over 300 million yeast cells in it. Those yeast cells for their first three to four hours are gonna be in what we call aerobic mode. They're gonna be eating oxygen and replicating over and over and over again. Now, as you look at this in the beginning when it's in aerobic mode, it's gonna look just like what Sam showed you back here. It's just gonna look like that 300 gallon bowl of creamy white grits. All of a sudden, about three, four hours later, you're gonna to start to see it move. Right, and if you've been binge, binge watching sci-fi all night, that's a little bit creepy. And you'll hear a crunching noise going on. And when you've got a whole bunch of these on the floor and it's first thing in the morning, it's a little bit creepy. 
right? Then all of a sudden you'll see the first bubble come up. Then it will start bubbling like crazy. Then as you can see, you know, CJ show them where it boils over on the, over there. So you'll actually see this. Yeah, it'll, it'll go from that mild mannered 300 gallon bowl of grits to that high school volcano, you know, experiment that you did. And a lot of times it'll just boil over. Now, the reason it's doing that is once the yeast runs out of dissolved oxygen, right? So when these guys pump that over, they're gonna pump it up from up high and get a lot of dissolved oxygen in there. That'll allow us to go from about 300 million yeast cells to over 400 billion yeast cells. So we've got a whole yeasty beastie army in there. Once it runs out of oxygen, it'll flip over biologically um, to anaerobic mode and it'll start eating the sugar and the nutrients and creating alcohol, creating flavor, creating carbon dioxide, CO2, which is what is bubbling up from here, right? And it'll also create a bunch of heat. So it's self-heating, it's an exothermic reaction. So it will create its own heat. If we're not careful, it'll create enough heat to raise the temperature of 300 gallons, 10 degrees in under four hours. So these guys have to always make sure that we keep this mash between 65 and 95 degrees, right? So we choose our yeast strains because of the flavors that we wanna get. But we also choose our yeast strain to make sure this doesn't get too hot or too cold. So if this mash temperature were to go above 95 degrees, the metabolism of that yeast will physically change. And instead of getting the butter, vanilla, caramel, butterscotch foundation that we're looking for, we're gonna get something more like root beer and hot dogs and we don't really want that in our bourbon. Uh, so we gotta watch that top end temperature. If this were to get too hot, it starts approaching that, then we've gotta go into immersion chillers, uh, something like that. Uh, if it goes below 60 degrees, now we're hitting the low end and the process of fermentation will stall. And if fermentation stalls, that's when bad bacteria can get in and that causes a whole lot of other issues for us. So at the end of that first, what would you say, 24 hours? Almost 24? Yeah, so you'll see it starts to create a grain cap. So we'll walk you over. I'm gonna let these guys, I think we're just about to present product. So thank you guys. So this is what happens in the first day. Fermentation over a seven day period in our schedule is going to create all of the foundation that we need, right? So you can see this is still pretty active on how this actually boiled over. Now, what we try to explain to people is the only place in a distillery where alcohol is physically created is in a fermenter, right? So fermenters create alcohol, stills separate. Doug has the science of distillation down to, well, a science. After all that, they bottle up those delicious spirits, label them, and get them ready to go into the hands of eagerly awaiting customers. And if there's one thing that we've learned at Moonrise, it's to expect the unexpected. Now that we've seen the process, it's time to check out their Welcome Center speakeasy and enjoy some of these spirits that we've learned so much about. Well, hey, welcome, come on in. Hey guys, welcome to Moonrise. Well, come on in and make yourself at home. Um, glad you're here. We got uh, a couple different ways you can enjoy our products. We have uh, 20 things that we share with you on a flight system and if you know like a certain cocktail we got a full bar we are uh, offer tours you can uh, sit in our uh, patio on the north and enjoy the weather we got a good shopping over here to the left and we're just glad you come in to give us a little bit of your time so this crazy dream we call moonrise every day we uh, we look at each other at the end of a long day and we say to ourselves yeah, thank you this is so crazy, it just might work. But at the end of the day, this whole thing started with a goal to recreate what old distilleries used to be like. They were family operations. Everybody that worked there was family. They would never, ever let a customer have a bad experience and they would never make bad whiskey. <laughs> so uh, we owe everything to God and our customers. You know, we have the best customers that come here. Uh, we started this business with a very simple premise that if you 
created products that people wanted, if you gave them an experience they wanted to be a part of, and a backstory that they could connect with, you could grow your business. It was how we used to build businesses in, in this country. So uh, we set out to do that, and uh, this distillery is now 10 years old. We just had our 10 year anniversary, and thanks to all of our customers, we've been able to go from 30 people a month to thousands and thousands of people a month. And uh, you know, we're in over 700 plus liquor stores, bars, and restaurants around Georgia. And we have our customers to thank for that. So they, uh, people come here and we treat them like family. And we try to make the best products that we possibly can. And crazy things happen. They come back and they bring friends. and. Uh, they go into the local liquor stores and bars and restaurants and they say, hey, we really want Moonrise. And uh, that means so much more than if we sent salespeople out there to meet up with these people. So uh, that's really what, uh, what makes it. Jen is an amazing face. If you look at thousands of postings online, they all say the same thing. Jen's never met a stranger and they love her smile and they love her hugs. Right. So she's out there, uh, she's the face when people walk in the door. And uh, so at the end of the day, being a family operation, there are very few things in life that you get to do and do it with your match in every way, right? And uh, do it as a family. Right? So every day we get to do this together. And thanks to our customers, every day we grow a little bit bigger. And this entire renovation that we had to do is because of our customers. Right, so the uh, the more they come, the more we needed to expand, and uh, so that's a that's a blessing. Uh, there's very few things that you get to do where you're passionate about it, and you get to share it with people that are actually interested. You know, so uh, between our customers, the other businesses in our community that have supported us, you know, like crazy, uh, you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself, and. That's a pretty special thing to be able to do. So uh, we're blessed people, we work hard, we try to take good care of people, and we try to make the best products you possibly can from local ingredients wherever we can, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Moonrise Distillery is a place where passion, science, and art are interwoven to create something truly unique and exceptional. Moonrise is in great hands with Doug, with his boundless knowledge and love for the craft, it's a recipe that's sure to succeed. We enjoyed our time there, learning new facts about the science of distillation and sharing drinks with some great people. Thank you for joining us down here at the Rick House for another episode. I'm Greg, your host, and we'll see you next season for some more incredible distilleries. <laughs>